Welcome to the Circularity Edge podcast, where we discuss the latest news and perspectives on the circular economy and issues relating to social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Join us every week when we discuss what's needed to create a sustainable circular economy worldwide. Now, here is your host, Ken Alston. Hello, this is Ken Alston with the Circularity Edge podcast on April the 22nd, 2020. Happy Earth Day, Earth Week, Earth Year, and so on. It is still my sincere hope that we can do better than only celebrate the world on which we live for just one day of the year. With that said, I'm extremely happy today to introduce a conversation I had yesterday with Walter Stahel. Walter is one of the leading thinkers on matters concerning the circular economy, and he has been engaged actively on this subject for a lifetime. Walter is the founder director of the Product Life Institute based in Switzerland. It is the oldest established consultancy in Europe devoted to developing sustainable strategies and policies. Walter is also the author of the book, The Circular Economy, A User's Guide, which was published last year. What follows is an open conversation I had with Walter with no prearranged topics or planning other than a common desire to talk about our joint interest in promoting a transition to the circular economy. I learned a lot from this conversation with Walter, and I hope you do too. Welcome, Walter, to the Circularity Edge podcast. Okay, yeah. How, how How are things there? Uh, today there is no sun, but uh, we haven't had any rain for 40 days, so it's getting critical. Oh my goodness, yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for agreeing to be here on, uh, on my Circularity Edge podcast. I appreciate it very much. Where are you based? In, on I'm, the East uh, Coast? Yeah, I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the center of Virginia. Okay. So we are, uh, we are still in our... In our uh, coronavirus lockdown officially. Oh, we are uh, too. So, yeah, we'll maybe talk about that in a in a little while. Um, you know, we've both been working for many years on these big topics like sustainable development and now what we call the circular economy. And um, uh, the reason you know for having this conversation is that I, I hope that we have a little experience to uh, to offer, maybe even a little wisdom. So, uh, so with that said, uh, let's jump in. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot lately about the fact that it's been now 33 years since the Brundtland Commission, uh, you know, published the report and the the definition of sustainable development, and yet, you know, here we are with a lot of effort being made by many people all over the world, and we're still unsustainable. Um, is this the reason why you wrote the book, Circular Economy, A User's Guide, or did you have a, another motivation behind, behind the, the book? Okay. I wrote the first report uh, to the European Commission in 1976 on the potential for substituting manpower for energy. And then there were ups and downs until 2010 when the Ellen MacArthur Foundation picked up the topic for which I was very grateful because they brought it to a much broader audience. But then uh, everybody started to jump on the bandwagon. And the same, I feared the same thing would happen with circular economy as happened with sustainable development that he, once you have 400 def- different definitions, you have lost uh, the whole thing. And that's why I wrote uh, the, the book, a User's Guide, because I try to structure clearly the circular economy and what is not circular economy. Right, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, uh, I agree with you on this, this whole definitional question. I've, uh, I've talked about it a lot myself and uh, it's, well, well, we'll come back to come back to it because I I saw in in my own LinkedIn profile, for example, I put the word circular economy in my profile several years ago, and in fact, I have circular economy as my handle, my username, and um, 
but yet in the last two years, there's a complete proliferation of people who claim to be experts who, you know, oh, yes. who, who've never spent more than a few minutes, I think, thinking about it. Um, and and to, that, to that same point, I still see a lot of people jumping on this and, and thinking that it's just recycling, you know, more recycling, we have to do more recycling, it's recycling on steroids. In the, in the book, you, you make a, obviously a much more precise statement that it's about asset management to maintain the unity and value of stocks for the longest possible time. Explain why there's so much more to circularity than, than just recycling and more recycling. Well, the two main strategies are the product life extension or service life extension strategies, reuse, remarket, repair, remanufacture, refill, reprogram computers. And the big difference between that strategy and the other strategy of a recovering uh, molecules and atoms is that in manufacturing we are talking about m synthetic or man-made products you use a lot of water and a lot of energy produce a lot of co2 emissions and as long as the, uh, no, an object lives it these uh, water and co2 emissions are preserved and bodied if you go into recycling or recovering the molecules, you lose this investment of water and CO2 emissions. And this for me is, should be for policymakers, the main case why they should focus on reusing service life extension of objects, including infrastructure and buildings, because then you really save considerable amounts of water and you prevent CO2 emissions. Right, so you're not you're not having to start over again basically with yes, all the new inputs again. Yeah. Yes, if you uh, aluminum is the only material where you save about 90% of the original energy otherwise it's uh, you basically go back to point one, and the second point about recovering mo molecules, sorry, versus recycling, is a, a study done by a Swedish consultant for the Swedish um, Recycling Association, where he showed that what we measure is the volume of stuff of materials recycled but he analyzed the value that is maintained in a recycling loop and then it's disastrous because for steel or aluminum Sweden shows that they recycle 90 percent and value wise it's only 25 or 30 percent in each cycle so it's really a down cycling downgrading unfortunately, the way we do it today. So even though it's reused in a, a relatively high quality end, end state, it's still a downgrading because you're putting more yes. inputs in again. But, yeah, because you dilute the, the material and you lose, of course, entropy, you lose always a bit. And in steel recycling, for example, you always get copper and with mm -hmm. each recycling, and once you have reached about 3% copper, then you can no longer really use the steel for anything. So one of the other things you, you said, I think quite early on in the book, I think in chapter one, was that the objective behind the circular economy is to maintain, the, the, exactly you said, the values and manage the stocks of assets, but assets of all sorts, not just materials not just manufactured you know you included natural cultural human and financial stocks as well say a little yes. bit more about this because i think most of what everybody talks about focuses on the material part and as you say there's a consequential energy and water piece that always comes along with materials but what about these other things that we're not including 
Well, the, the term sustainability is about 300 years old and comes from forestry in Saxony and then moved to England, then moved to the States. So the, the, the common denominator of managing stocks, of maintaining the value of stocks is caring. Mm -hmm. And caring is labor intensive. If you care about environment or natural parks or uh, forests, or if you care about people, look at uh, what's happening with COVID-19 in hospitals, or you care for cultural objects in museums, it always needs skills and a, lo a lot of labor input. And the, 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 the the, the movement has in the last 10 years or maybe even before, maybe I'm also 40 in the beginning, has been focused on manufactured objects, mm -hmm. buildings and cars and uh, remanufacturing these things, repairing them. Now that the trend, the new trend I see is that we are moving away from the area of R, from ex service life extension of objects, towards the recovering molecules. Because now we start to develop circular chemistry. We start uh, re through research, we have found molecules that can be re recycled forever or engin engineered enzymes that can even de-polymerize uh, uh, pet bottles, but there is also an invisible part of the circular economy, which is liability. Because we, by f if we change the focus and look at wasted resources in another way, I define waste as objects with no positive value and no liable owner. So that means policymakers can give they have two options. Either they give a value to objects through deposit laws, for example, or they nominate, they legislate a liable owner who has to take the objects back. Is the extended producer responsibility? Yes. And by the efficiency of this extended producer liability is that a responsibility shows up in your corporate social report a liability shows up in your financial statements. And it is an open liability, in this case open with regard to the value and to the time when it will be due. And this is absolute poison for any investor. So this should be CSL, not CSR. And, and then if we include if we define this extended producer liability, manufacturers will have to change their business model or they will no longer find investors who want to gamble on this. Right, because again, it's bringing, it's bringing that liability into, into, uh, into view. It's no longer yes. a hidden. No longer and a hidden it's, a, it's a liability that increases every year with the sales. So more, every yeah. year it gets more and more and then we, uh, would you invest in a company that you want to invest in a company that where the profits go up every year, not, not, the, not the liabilities. Right. Say, say a little bit more about, you mentioned the, in passing that the, what in the book you call the era of R and the era of D. How does this, how do these two pieces play together? The owner user of objects and the owner manager of used objects. Explain that a little bit more for us. Well, the, the area of R, which is the service life extension, is under control of the owner user. If you buy an object, you become the owner, but also liable for whatever you do with it. And uh, so how, how you use it and how long you use it is up to you. So therefore, in the area of R, we are the circular economy. In the area of D, for D-linking molecules, the polymerization, the person in control is 
a, a recycler who or or a municipalities for for some waste that has no technical knowledge or or skills uh, and so therefore he will go for the cheapest solution because any if he would go for a high value solution he would have to invest a lot in in knowledge and skills and equipment and so that's why the area of d the way we do it today recycling always goes for the cheapest solution because that gives the recycler a profit and so you know i i, I worked with um a group in medellin just outside medellin colombia who are trying to work on what happens after a car is crashed and is no longer usable and they have a you know a law in in colombia that that means this group has to take back it's in space it's basically the insurance industry um retains gets the ownership back of the crashed vehicle having paid out on the policy and now they have the job of trying to get value from whatever's left in that car that's no longer drivable and of course you know i've actually I've been there and spent a lot of time with them and they do an excellent job very you know as high tech as you can imagine given the circumstances of reusing as much materials as you can being very careful in how they take things apart getting as much value from reselling things that can be reused as well as, yeah. but, but of course they're they're ultimately limited by the design of the car itself and so there's a natural limit to what they can do without somebody further up or, or lower down the design, really the design end, making a better a, a better solution that they're able to, to make use of. You know, in, in the warehouse, they showed me so many uh, bins of things that they've collected that they don't know what to do with because they don't fit in this in this you know theoretical universe. How do we get? How do we push that responsibility and that get that liability piece back in? Does it have to be a government-imposed thing? Well, the, the we had uh, we have the sim a similar uh, enterprise in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and the actually the most profitable way of doing this uh, this scrapyard is that you take the same model car one that at the front end accident the other back end accident you cut it in two and re-weld it together oh, now man. you are laughing yeah. but this is this is how the extended uh, limousines are are made of course yes and so there is actually a predefined cutting point where you can mm -hmm. do this but uh, then you run into problem with intellectual property rights and uh, mm. then you get all these protection, at least in Europe, protections uh, by manufacturers. And there is a big difference uh, also for spare parts. In Germany, spare parts are uh, copyrighted for 50 years. In Italy, it's only one year. And oh, okay. so if you need cheap repairs for any European car, go to Italy. But then when you come back, for example, Germany, you run a risk that the customs will actually confiscate your car. Mm -hmm. So it, exactly. So mm -hmm. we are not trying to uh, valorize the most what, uh, what we have, the used objects we have, but we are trying to protect the manufacturing yes, industry. Mm -hmm. I was going to say it's a protectionist approach. Yeah. Yeah. So that brings me to an, another topic then, which is, which, you know, the fact that you've crossed, although it's within the you know, European Union, which is free flow of, of people and goods. No um, longer, no longer. It's all no suspended. Longer, <laughs> suspended for the moment. Um, but, you know, it brings up this question of global and local. You know, we've, we've, we've often heard these general statements. I've used them myself many times, you know, all sustainability is local and, and we've got to think global, act local, things like this. And there's a lot of truth in these underlying statements, but the, the difficulty is always putting it into practice. I mean, I think myself, if I, it doesn't matter if my washing machine was made in China, right now it's here in my apartment or my home. And so ultimately at the end of its useful 
life or its use, end of its use. The next step is here. Yes. And, you know, I bought it and so I own it. So in, in that model you were talking about, the R model, it's my liability now to do something with. And there's no infrastructure. You know, it was, we've never really been putting in place the, the systems to make this work. How does someone act locally when there doesn't seem to be a, a, any way to, to do it? I mean, in, in fact, where I am, it's even crazier on a basic recycling level. We've gone back to um, single stream recycling as if it's some new concept. This just means we have one bin and everything goes in it and there's not even any separation. Why? Because it's cheap. You only send one truck. And so it's like, almost like, we fall over ourselves to do the wrong thing just because it's, you know, the least expensive. How, how do we break out? You know, it, it's, a, it's good for us to have an intellectual conversation. Yes. But well, somehow the, we have to make it work in the real world, right? Uh, on the object level, the area of R, uh, in Europe, but also in the States, uh, Kyle Wien, the, the I'llFixit.com, are fighting for a right to repair. Mm -hmm. So that whatever object you have, uh, you can you may repair it even if the manufacturer thinks it should be thrown away. But uh, on the the area of D, the recycling, the molecule recovering molecule level, uh, there is another problem that in in Europe uh, we had since the 1990s we had these recycling laws. And we assumed we collected things in 20 different bins and we assumed they would be recycled. And when China two years ago or three years ago stopped importing any mixed waste, all that stuff suddenly flooded back into Europe and we realized Europe has never recycled anything. We just uh, moved it we, to another we, part of the world. Well, we did recycle glass. But uh, the, the well, you, you sort of you sort of have to do that to at least probably thirty percent just to make it glass making work, right? Yeah, and the, the the problem is that we are importing most wines and beers in bottles, so we are flooded with the re glass recycling is flooded with mm -hmm. glass, but the demand for glass is relatively small, and the same with many other elements, and. So the in Switzerland we have no more landfill. We we burn incinerate everything, and then it makes sense to only separate metals and glass, all the things that don't burn. But for example, plastics uh, and and even cardboard, because there is no more cardboard. Uh, market because of China that no longer wants it. So it's actually much simpler, cheaper to put it in the big bin and, and incinerate everything. And now this, this price for secondary resources is really, it doesn't make sense to recycle if, if you don't, can't sell the secondary or the, the raw materials. And I don't know if you have heard the news yesterday, even uh, oil is now trading at a negative price. Yes, I saw that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you want to give your wife a nice present, <laughs> Christmas present, buy an oil tanker and give it to her and uh, right. you will be, you get money for it. <laughs> I'm just not sure about the, my cost of storage that I have to do with it. But, but I know what you mean. It, it is yeah. definitely so, so a cost it, it, to every time. It, it's crazy. We, so the, we now in Switzerland, if we want to get rid of cardboard boxes in some municipalities, we have to pay to get rid of. Yeah. But we don't have to pay if we put it in the incineration bit, bin. So the, there must be a market for used objects and for used uh, materials. Now, how do you create uh, a market for used objects. The, the third party liability insurance in many countries means that you get the, the time value, you get 
for a 70 year old car you get nothing and for a 20 year old car you get, don't get anything either and in belgium i think belgium was the first country that said okay this is it's not the insurance company that should decide on this it's the owner of the the, the victim uh, of the car and uh, they the belgian courts now give you a choice you can either have the money from the insurance company or demand that the insurance company gives you a an other used car that is not the same same same, same model level. same mm -hmm. same state of the art and uh, mm -hmm. not not older than the, the car than your car and then that then immediately creates a functioning market for second hand cars because the if that market doesn't exist then the insurance company has to buy you a much newer car because they can't find an old car a seven or ten year old car well, they can only go up they can't go down yes. yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah. so therefore it's uh it's, it's really creating markets i think is the is the secret of mm. for used goods and uh, used materials so that sort of brings us to you know the, the your, your mention there of, of cardboard makes me think about the two cycles, basically the natural cycle, the biological cycle, and then technical cycles. And we seem to have this inability to find a way of, you know, blending the two. Um, I mean, sh should the cardboard really be collected and composted or is it better to just burn it because that's the easier thing to do? How do we, how do we get these two cycles to somehow work together? Well, uh, I think in, in, regions where you have uh, sophisticated incinerators that will recover the heat and then produce uh, steam and uh, electricity and district heating for the heat in the end and then in many cases it doesn't make sense to collect uh, plastics or or paper or cardboard if you don't have recyclers that are working profitably you shouldn't throw it into nature because nature gets uh, very often overwhelmed with the volume. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the big secrets is that the Chinese were right. If a farmer dies, they, he will be buried on his fields. In our civilized countries, of course, we have cemeteries, but if you analyze the groundwater below any cemetery, it you can't drink it it's completely polluted with ammoniac because when we decompose unfortunately we produce ammoniac ammonia. Mm -hmm. yeah ammonium mm -hmm. and uh, so either again it's incineration or then uh, it's decentralized funerals but not everybody at the same place so the n nature works in a decentralized fashion and so but it it cannot cope with toxic elements if it if it's man-made toxins and it cannot cope with accumulation of waste which so means for, rural, for cities for cities where we have millions if not a billion people in some of the biggest cities this is clearly a, a consideration then uh, yeah then then nature circularity doesn't work then it's our responsibility and for any synthetic materials anyway plastics for example plastics is a fantastic material mm -hmm. you can shape it and color it in any way you want but it's a man-made material and you may not it may not escape into the nature it's our responsibility i think this is an important part that we we tend to forget that you know we are a part of nature and that the yes. technical cycle, we you know we put the butterfly diagram or whatever little structure we want, which is illuminating. You know, I, I, I talk yes. about this a lot. The concepts are simple. The real world is complex. And we, we use simple concepts in order to get an idea across. And this is okay because you're just trying to change people's perception or how they look at something. But then when you actually have to actualize something in the real world with all the complexity, 
it's not like this. It's not a butterfly with two wings. The biological cycle, the technical cycle is in the biological cycle. And this whole question of leakage becomes an important consideration. Well, it, it now gets worse with a, what we call bioeconomy, which mm. includes DNA and uh, CR, what's it called? Uh, the, well, the engineered enzymes and biosimilars, uh, RNA, uh, CRISPR. There mm -hmm. are so many genetic technologies Changes, and yeah. And there, uh, it's basically in your natural cycle, but the way we manipulate it, I'm, I'm not sure if nature can still recycle it or if it's not become part of the tech cycle. Right, right, because we've made a technical change yes. in a biological system. Uh, and, th and then we have, to, we are responsible for not letting it escape into nature. I, I talk a, a lot about, I sometimes get a little bit pedantic in my use of English, you know, because I, I sometimes think we're very, uh, we're too, too liberal in our, in our use of words, and therefore we don't convey the proper meaning. That's correct. And, uh, you know, I think in, I, I've sometimes railed against, you know, life cycle because most of these things aren't alive, and thankfully there's more, there's more, use of the word use now right so we use things more than uh, and we have an end of use um but i think i think this is true in in many different ways and uh, when i think about sustainability you know we and circular economy i've called sometimes for putting the word sustainable before circular because i think people forget these other pieces like society you know, when I work in South America, it's very different than working in Europe. The, the societal situation is quite different. And people can look to the Netherlands or to Switzerland or Germany or wherever in Europe for some good ideas because you've had money available in the EU to work on circularity and you've been trying things. So there's a, there's a lot of, um, you know, good rich material to, to look at. Um, but you can't just import that to a different place because the society is different, the culture is different. Yes. Um, you know, so I, I, do you, do you well, think we need to somehow upweight the social and these other pieces? Because circular economy on its own, I think, doesn't always give you that impression. Well, let, uh, let me come back to the terminology. I fully agree with that. And I, I've convinced OECD... Uh, that this uh, a month ago at the at the meeting, no longer talk about waste. Mm -hmm. Talk about wasted resources, yeah. because we all know resources cost money, and so therefore wasted resources are is wasted money. And then yeah. why should you manage wasting money? Uh, doesn't right. make it's sense. Like, it, to me, it's like, as long as you use the, I've said this too, as long as you use the word waste, you allow it to exist. Yes. <laughs> it's, so, yeah, so really, it, it's, it should be at least materials management and not waste. Yes. Right? Yes. Or, or yeah. And uh, now the, the same with the, the uh, but I've failed, I've ridiculized, ridiculized the, the UN in many meetings talking about sustainable production and consumption oh. when you talk about cars or airplanes or so food, food is okay but anything else is sustainable use as yep. you said exactly uh, but it's it's just which makes difficult sdg to, it makes sdg 12 or whatever number it is yeah. so crazy right because it's sort of fixated on this this yeah this and the, if you say sustainable consumption then it means uh, you you have a good conscience consuming because it's sustainable. Right, right. So the designer somewhere has declared it's sustainable, um, and the the cultural divide. Uh, the if you go back in time, all the early civilizations were circular societies because they simply didn't have the 
materials mm -hmm. or the products. Scarcity, the scarcity piece. Exactly. There was a, the famous use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. This is just my duck sound annoying everybody okay. because I'm not taking care of him. <laughs> <laughs> he deserves to be, to be around too. He's just jealous. Has it? You know, it's a German duck sound. So uh, he has a German character. He, he <laughs> well, knows you know, what he wants and he will get it. Or <laughs> that's right, and, and so he else. should. <laughs> anyway, so the the then the I don't think it's possible to go from a circular economy of scarcity to a circular economy of. Uh, abundance without going through a society of um, an economy of abundance and that's what where we are now in no sorry where we were, were before uh, COVID-19 before right. the coronavirus <laughs> that yeah, we, we, we've, we've fallen we've fallen down to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy again you could buy anything any color any whatever quantity and so in in a uh, society of abundance you need a motivation why you should not buy protect me from what i want uh, the american artist uh, said and I, I this is the big challenge and uh, no politician is tackling this motivation motivating people not to buy because of course the whole economy is still geared on producing more yeah, and the linear the linear flow is, is yeah, everything the, the, the more, more throughput is more gdp yeah. uh, but we should really motivate people to use things intelligently but uh, use what you have um, so this is more of the performance economy and the sharing economy. Yes, and my definition of a circular economy or in one line is looking after and taking care of your belongings. Mm -hmm. Because live with what you have and enjoy life rather yeah. than enjoy going shopping. So the, there is a lot of cultural factors and if we if we could find a way to in the third world countries to avoid them going through this abundance uh, but that is that the, there is a the, the success story of the third, of the linear industrial economy is their marketing uh, publicity with, with the what I call the bigger, better, faster, safer, greener syndrome. Yeah. And whenever something comes up, they should simply add a new thing. But it's basically always clones, pro, clone products of the ones you had before. And there is, a, a, in the, I don't know if you have heard in the US, the Midwest, there is now a run for secondhand uh, John Deere tractors, farming equipment, harvester combines, because people have realized that the equipment they had 20 years ago had no electronics and they right. could easily repair it repair themselves, them themselves yeah. Or, yeah. or locally uh, through mm -hmm. a blacksmith or whatever. Whereas with the electronics, they have to wait until a serviceman comes and then pay Some him three tech. days for the travel and um and and so people suddenly start to, the users suddenly start to realize the beauty of having the goods without electronics right and and i think once this um uh, it, it it's getting conscious of something and that will then be a motivation not to buy certain things anymore. I also saw a statistic by one of the big uh, IT consultancies that the, the number of secondhand smartphones in the last quarter 
was the first time higher than the number of new smartphones sold. Mm, interesting. And and so people start to, I, I don't know if because of price, because of simplicity, uh, or be, because people start to realize that with the new smartphones, uh, you no longer control neither your data nor your phone. And right. uh, Apple in France was fined multi-million dollar fine because they, when they introduced, I think, app, uh, iPhone 7, they, they made an upgrade on all the existing phones that made them much smaller and reduced battery power. And the French government uh, punished them for that heavily. Mm. But I think people may slowly realize to look at progress differently from what the marketing tells them. Yeah. So let's, uh, you mentioned COVID a couple of times. Let, let's sort of uh, perhaps end, end on, on this note that, um, are, you, are you generally optimistic or pessimistic that this crisis that has obviously made all, all things come to a halt, we're in a shutdown globally pretty much, gradually trying to open it up. Are, are, you, are you optimistic or pessimistic that we'll revert to the norm and quickly go back because everybody wants to be at work again and be productive? Or, or do you think there will be some some questioning at that at that sort of level you were talking about? Enough to make a change. Well, first of all, in, in with home working and homeschooling and home, all the things we do here, people and also the the, the webinars, people realize that they can actually live differently. They don't have to commute every day two hours by car and they start to see the pros and cons of of this other life uh, and i think a lot of them will not go back to uh, the same for companies if they realize yeah. they don't need all these office buildings exactly. and customer fortune uh, yeah. but the reason another reason why i think we are stuck with this coronavirus is the experts agree that unless we get a vaccine, we will we will be very vulnerable. And so therefore, governments will not simply let you live the way you were, open the borders. And in the States, I always tell people, you are lucky because you don't have borders between the states that you can close. In Europe now, we, the whole of Europe, every country no longer lets people in and out. And so, for example, Swiss airlines or Swiss, uh, yeah, at the, at the national airline, they have hundreds of airplanes, yeah. but they are actually using three of them at the moment, simply mm. because there's nowhere to fly while well, they fly right. to. Beijing to get uh, face masks and things like this yes. with uh, converted passenger planes. But, but it's, it, it, the COVID has shown that we have enough stuff. We, we can actually live with what we have in most cases, uh, what, the, the, at least the physical the, 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 the area of our stuff where we are terribly short is with disposable goods such as uh, face masks and mm -hmm. uh, certain equip medical equipment but the problem there is that th there is no resilience because all most of these things are imported and unfortunately most of them are produced in Wuhan. Yes. So when, exactly. when the factory is closed down, that was the end of the line. Yeah. And the conclusion that I think many governments will draw is that we, at least for strategic materials and goods, we need a national production. Even exactly. if, if it's more expensive, even yeah. if there are certain uh, reasons why importing would make sense, but we can no longer take the, the risk like this time 
that uh, we really had a, well, you in, in the States too, a health emergency where I've heard that Trump, your president blocked exports of, of certain equipment to Canada. I mean, for God's sake, we, the other thing that we have in, in Europe, uh, possibly also you in the States, is that our civilization has broken down because we now no longer can uh, go to a funeral of a friend yes. because only four people are allowed. <clears throat> and in, in Italy, even I lost a friend in, in February, and not even his widow was allowed to right, attend the funeral. Yeah, and yeah. Th this, th I mean, this is a situation we, we don't want to see again. So I hope that governments realize there is that uh, 2019 was the last year of a folly that was only possible with a huge consumption of resources and uh, consumer society and traveling to, to the, end, end, the other end of the world uh, just for a wedding or something. And now we have the exact opposite and we realize mm -hmm. The, the, neither of these two situations is something you want to live again. Well, Walter, I could continue this for a long time and I hope maybe that we can set another time for a, a second round because there's so much more we could talk about. I'd love to talk about efficiency more. We, we, you just touched a little bit on politics there, which I, I, I steered clear of today, but clearly when you have... Um, the Trumps of the world and the Bolsonaros of the world, you, you can have a totally different outcome than uh, if you made other choices, but that's, that's, um, that's probably a discussion for another day. I, I really want to thank you for uh, taking the time today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and a, a treat for me to, to be talking with you and, and sharing your, your thoughts with them. Um, well, thank you podcast. for inviting me. Oh, it's been, it's, been, uh, it's been a joy and I hope we can do it again. With great pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank um, you, Ken. You're welcome. All the best. Yes, bye bye. Stay safe. Stay safe. Yep, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you again, Walter. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and you learned something new. There are a lot of gems in this uh, conversation that I had with Walter today, and I recommend you listen to it more than once. I also recommend Walter's book, The Circular Economy, a user guide to you. If you're still sheltering in place, you could learn a lot from taking the time to read this important text. I will put a link in the text to go with this podcast uh, so you can click through and take a look. So this is Ken Alston with the Circularity Edge podcast signing off. Until next time, stay healthy. You've been listening to the Circularity Edge podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new, fresh weekly episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at www.circularityedge.com. Until next time, bye Circular. Circular.